ETG that just isn't printing right on multiple different printers, overhangs not looking the way that they should, and, well, I still have a crusade against white filament. All this and more, Print Fix Friday, episode 117. Let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. And if you're new here and you're dealing with some 3D printing issues, don't worry, we are here to help and we will help you get back to printing with purpose. If you wanna reach out to us directly, you can do so by sliding into those DMs. Twitter's probably the best one these days. Or you can email us directly, youtube at 3dmusketeers.com and we'll help you out totally for free. That's what we do here. We enjoy it and all we ever ask is, uh, you know, hey, leave a like and get subscribed all totally free. It's a great deal as far as I'm concerned. We got some interesting fails for you guys today and the overall theme is PETG. It's not an often seen material here on Print Fix Friday, but it is one that can give you a lot of problems, even if you're really good at printing PLA. It is a whole different animal that has a few different material properties that can make it both really enjoyable to print, but also quite a big nightmare depending on where you might live. So let's get into this, uh, translucent red one we got here. Transparent filament. Well, I use DOS filament PETG on my Ender 3 V2. The recommended temperature for it is 230 plus or minus 10 and 75 plus or minus 5. I printed the house on the left with 230 and 75. For the house in the middle, I started off with 240 and 75. In the middle, where you can see the quality change, I lowered the temperature to 220. That is way too low for PETG. So I thought I had it figured out. So I stopped the print and started again with 220 and 70. And as you can see in the second picture, that also has lots of blobs. Now the surface feels smooth, so the blobs must be appearing on the inside. Maybe this happens with every filament, but with the transparent red, you can just see those bubbles. Now, I have heard something like this where I decrease the temperature and I get less blobs. It has something to do with wet filament? Is that the problem? Well, maybe. It's PETG, so it has a higher tendency to uptake moisture. And we can see some, you know, elements of stringing here, so you might have some sort of issues when it comes to wet filament. But it's not the traditional wet filament that we think of. If we look and we zoom in here, we can see some little bubbles that's out of focus and doesn't really help all that much. But yeah, we've got little bubbles here. This is likely due to just basic filament cavitation. At 220C, you are at the very low end of what PETG likes to print at. In fact, I would go hotter like 240, 250 with something like this and see if that will change the way that these parts look. The hotter you go with PETG, the more transparent it will be to an extent. The colder it goes, of course, also to an extent, the more matte or opaque that the filament will look. In this case, I think we're actually dealing with the hot end really having to overwork to get the filament out. Now, because it's PETG, putting it in a dryer and printing out of a dryer is not a problem. Just do it. There, it's no big deal. And if you have a dryer and you're using PETG a lot, you might as well just go ahead and print it out of the dryer. It's not going to hurt the filament, but it can absolutely help it. And in humid environments like we are here in Florida, where it is late November and it is 50% ambient humidity in here. It's a little humid. You will still have to dry it. Now in colder places like Colorado and New York and places where you tend to get a lot of snow, even though snow is just frozen rain, it apparently dries everything out or at least so I'm told. Certainly Colorado, when we went out there for the Rocky Mountain Rep Rep Fest, which if you're curious, we did a whole series on what car to it so you guys can take a look. But it is something you have to keep in mind if you live in a more humid environment. It's not going to hurt the filament. It could only really help it. So if you have a dryer, go ahead and dry it. And if you can print out of the dryer, great. There are some new dryers on the market. In fact, we just got the new Ibos dryer, which we're going to be doing a video on at some point, probably just a live stream where we print out of it or something like that. So let me know if you guys want to see that. If you'd rather see a live stream, if you'd rather see a channel video. And I think we are going to be revisiting the wet filament thing. I definitely haven't had a spool soaked in water for over a year. Anyways, let's move on. Z-banding, same layers, every print. 
I bought this printer secondhand like four months ago and I've pretty much played with all of my settings. I upgraded the Z rods, the bed springs, the PTFE tube, and the extruder. And I added a Z rod stabilizer, tried a variety of temps and layer heights and all that stuff, still getting these bands, help much appreciated. It is an Ender 3 Kira 0.6. So the 0.6 is something that we should be keeping in mind here, but it looks like we might just have some overall wiggling. It's time to check those belts. Now, this is also white filament and white filament is often a fun problem. It will show issues that aren't there. And I want you to look at it in the light rather than the light shining down on it. There is definitely some sort of Z banding. And because it is reasonably consistent, we're going to want to check our belts and we're going to want to check our lead screws to make sure our lead screws are tight. The other thing to check is the V wheels to make sure that they are at the proper tension and are not loose, allowing all the carriages and stuff to kind of rock around. We did a video covering V wheels and how to tension them. It was a little bit difficult to film, but I think you guys will like it. We'll card to it so you can take a look. And now that we are getting better camera gear, it might be time to revisit some of those older videos where the information is good, but maybe we couldn't get the shots that we were looking for. But white filament is also notorious for just showing crap that isn't there. It is very, very common for white filament because it's pure, that pure titanium dioxide white. If it is even slightly out of skew from the layer below it, it's going to cast a shadow, which is going to make that small, likely meaningless issue be a huge problem that can easily be blown out of proportions. Check those belts, check those V wheels, and if all else fails, let's mess with temperatures, but I don't think it's going to be temperatures. It's likely going to be something in that Z axis, be it some wiggling that didn't exist prior, some wiggling that was introduced with all these upgrades, or you got some sort of loose component somewhere. It's not that difficult to diagnose and fix, but you got to get ahead of it or it's going to get ahead of you. But definitely check to see how this looks when you tilt it up at the light rather than the light shining down on top of it. Does anyone know what might be causing these lines? They appear directly after the seam on the outer perimeter as it starts. Using a Prusa MK2 with Prusa Slicer with stock settings and PLA. That's an older Prusa. Nice to see them still, well, kind of running. I'm getting gaps on the outer wall directly as it starts the outer perimeter. The inner perimeters are all fine and then the nozzle moves the outer one, but it looks like it doesn't start extruding until a tiny bit later, which causes the gaps in the surface. I've watched it happen and can see where the lines match up to the seams to the slicer. I've tried with retraction on and off, but it doesn't make a difference as there's no retraction at that specific point. Just moving to the outer perimeter from a different point on the inner perimeter. Increasing flow rate does not solve it either. Does anyone know what I can try or has anyone seen this before? This is very common if you have extra drag in your hot end. Now the Prusa hot end, even on the Mark II, is an E3DV6. There's a piece of PTFE tube inside of this. It does not go into the hot end, it's just to kind of help the filament go through. And I would guess that that piece of PTFE tube needs to be replaced. Also, if you still can, the 2.5 upgrade is absolutely worth it. So I would highly recommend it looking at it. The next thing that we can look at, gotta go inside a Prusa Slicer, which 2.7 is out, which is freaking amazing. And I'm very excited for it. In fact, we covered it in a previous video. We'll card to it so you guys can take a look. Under your print settings, there will be options that you can pull to change the settings that you're looking for. For you, this might be here under the retraction. While it's not technically retracting, you are likely dealing with some sort of extra crap here. The other thing that you want to check for is to make sure that your grub screws on your extruder gears are actually tight and working properly. If they aren't, let's get them retightened down. And if it is only happening on the outer wall, let's see if it's happening elsewhere too. If it is, then you might actually be experiencing a retraction. And because that gear is loose on the stepper motor, it's got some backlash that the motor has to take up before it can go ahead and start extruding again. There are a lot of potential problems here. 
I would say because it is a Mark II and it is a little bit older, let's go ahead and tear the thing apart. Let's look at that extruder. And hey, while we're in there, there is absolutely some upgrade parts that you can print to make that a better overall extruder and hot end combination. But we have seen this most commonly with loose scrub screws or not having enough restart when you go and do a retraction. In this case though, they're claiming there isn't a retraction. So I'm gonna go ahead and guess that it is the grub screws. Let me know what you guys think in those comments on this one. It's almost always the grub screws for me, but I, you know, it's always good to put it out there. Sometimes I miss very obvious issues. Eight hours, PETG print 200 grams has defects. Sunlu PETG 240 and 70, 180 millimeters a second. Yeah, that's why you're going to have some issues there. 5K Excel, no Z hop, out of perimeters printed last. This is otherwise a good print, but in this spot, it is a terrible mess which needs to be cleaned up somehow. Can you advise, please, on what went wrong here? Do I need to turn on Z hop? And if so, how much? Is there any other settings to adjust on the print? Let's take a look here. So, first off, 180 millimeters second for 240C, way too cold. Up that to 250. 260 even and we can see evidence of this this is because of issues with temperature if you can just turn up the temp you shouldn't see this problem again this is the extruder trying to push the filament through and you have a great extruder that is able to keep up with those speeds with this material this cold the best way to fix it though good old-fashioned sandpaper and sand it down there's not too much else that you can do other than reprint it but this part doesn't appear to be all that big I could be wrong, but it looks like it's kind of a medium sized part. So I'm wondering if you're not getting your full acceleration at only 5K. But for this particular piece, if you turn up the temperatures a little bit, you'll be all right. A little bit of stringing that we see here might be because the filament's slightly damp, but it's not that big of a deal. We're more worried about the blobbing that we see here, which is absolutely indicative of PETG that is way too cold. If you go ahead and turn up those temps, you'll also see the material get more shiny. Often you want PETG to be shiny. That means you're getting good layer adhesion. When PETG is cold and extruded relatively cold, it's not gonna make great bonds to the layer above and below it. Therefore, your parts are gonna be weaker than expected. Okay, and they're using a stealth burner tool head, so probably a Voron. I'm going to assume it's the Voron. Ten seconds later. Look at that, it's a Voron. Okay, and they are using Orca Slicer. Yeah, this is this is going to be related to temperature. Just turn those temps up and life will be good. I wouldn't worry about it at all. Actually, the commenter here has a great point. Is that a seam? As the hot end is traveling a long distance to reach it, some prints with long travel moves end up oozing a bit, even if your retraction settings are fine on other prints. And apparently there are no seams. Yep, so there are no seams in that area. But that doesn't mean the machine is not traveling. So if it's doing infill there potentially, you might have issues with that. Maybe a little bit of extra retraction. Give a little extra retraction just to be safe. It's not gonna hurt anything, but definitely look at upping those temperatures. Is this because of no supports? Dumb one, I know, but this dino head was supposed to be supportless, yet there is loose filament on the overhangs. Are no supports the cause of this, or is there another possible reason? Thanks for any help or critique. This one got my brain scratching itself. Well, if your brain can scratch itself, 3D printing is not the right career for you. This is fine. This is kind of what you would expect when you have a machine that doesn't do overhangs all that well. So this is a Creality K1, I believe. I don't know if it's a K1 or a K1 Max. I'm sure somebody will correct me in the comments, but based on the size of the dinosaur head, I'm fairly certain it's a K1. This is Sue, it, it's Sue's head. Sue is the most complete T-Rex in the world and was made into a 3D model like a decade ago by MakerBot for Thingiverse. It's still one of the most popular models. It prints completely supportless, and it's it's honestly a, a, a cool desk feature. In fact, I have one on my standing set, but it weighs like two and a half kilos because it was printed with a Lulzbot Taz 6 with the Moore Struder, which is a massive nozzle with one millimeter thick layers. It's dense. But yes, your issue is because your printer is moving likely so bloody fast, that it is not doing a good job of cooling those overhangs, so they sag ever so slightly, and the layers above it aren't sticking to it perfectly. The best thing that you can do here, if you want to fix it, is get a small, like, butane torch or micro torch, and just hit those areas a little bit. We can see some other damage on, 
I'm guessing that's one of the, I don't know, it's not an eye socket. One of the other holes in the skull. We can see some other issues there as well. That's going to be a cooling thing. But yeah, you grab a little micro torch. They're great. They're relatively cheap and you can get butane at pretty much any big box retailer here in the United States. These torches should be 10 bucks or less, generally speaking. They're really, really good. Uh, you can look it up as like a, a kitchen torch. That's what these are normally made for. And because they have a base, they don't generally fall over. So these are really great to use and would generally solve a lot of those issues. That issue will never completely go away though. You're always gonna see some little imperfections there, but to the average user, this print would look really good. And I agree, outside of those little tiny issues, that print looks great. That K1 did a great job printing. Anyways, guys, I wanna give a huge thank you to all of our channel supporters whose names are listed right next to me at the $5 tier and higher. This is the last Print Fix Friday where Grant actually has hair because technically Grant already doesn't have hair. He's just filming this stuff ahead of time because he's smart. <laughs> Anyways, guys, if you do want to support the efforts that we do here on the channel, you can do so by clicking those links in the description down below and joining Patreon, PayPal, or YouTube channel members for as little as $1 a month with the $10 tier and higher getting you access to our private Discord where we have a lot of fun and you get to see a lot of the behind the scenes, especially when it comes to the trips that we've been taking for, well, shaving my head, going to Smurf, and all the other awesome things that, you know, the regular YouTube channel has no idea is even coming. If you do enjoy these videos, don't forget to leave a like and get subscribed, but stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. And as always, keep making awesome. Have a good one.